This is Matthew Cratter from Trader University, and today I want to talk about what is easily the most important news story of 2022. I'm calling it Financial Nuclear Bomb Explodes, and it's this story, a uh, version of it that was published in the Wall Street Journal. If Russian currency reserves aren't really money, the world is in for a shock. So you can read this article. I think it's behind the paywall, paywall but I want to talk about it in today's video. So what happened is this, the Russian Federation, Russia has been stockpiling foreign currency reserves as they sell energy, as they sell oil and natural gas to the world. They keep some of those currencies and they stockpile them. So they've been stockpi stockpiling US dollars, euros, uh, British pound, Japanese yen, and gold as well. Obviously gold takes the physical form. We're gonna talk about that. The other FX reserves are held in two different forms. They're held in the form of securities like US treasuries and other government bonds. They're also held in the form of cash deposits at banks. And as it turns out, most of these cash deposits were in banks outside of Russia. Now, why would Russia want to stockpile FX reserves? Well, this has been a traditional way of defending your currency, especially since the Asian financial crisis of the late 90s. If you have a lot of foreign currency reserves, FX reserves, you can basically sell them and use them to prop up your currency. So for example, if you have a lot of dollars, if you have a lot of US dollars and the Russian ruble is selling off versus the US dollar, you can sell those US dollars and use them to buy Russian rubles in the foreign currency market. So this is why this is almost a form of, of national national defense, and Russia has been really increasing their FX reserves quite sharply over the past five to 10 years. Now, what happened over the past few days, we can see that the Russian ruble has completely cratered versus most, most uh, fiat currencies, especially the US dollar. We can see here what's happened as the, the chart moves down. That means the US dollar is strengthening and the Russian ruble is weakening. So you might ask the question, why weren't these FX reserves able to prevent this sort of crash in the currency. And you don't want your you don't want your currency, your local currency to crash too much because it makes it a very weak currency and then it becomes very difficult to import things like food, for example, and other necessities. Well, the reason Russia was not able to use these currency reserves to defend its currency is because these reserves have been mostly frozen by the by the EU, by the US and by Japan. So what they're basically doing, this happened um, a couple days ago, the US, Japan, and the EU got together and basically made it illegal for any of these banks to allow Russia to access the currency deposits and the securities that they were holding there. And what this meant is that even though Russia had these big FX reserves, it was not able to access it to defend its currency. We're going to talk a little bit uh, more uh, later in this video about why this is so important. But for right now, I'd ask you, if you're finding this video helpful so far, to hit that subscribe and like button. So we can dig in and take a look at how these reserves uh, were being held. This is a snapshot from the uh, Russian Central Bank. This has been snapshotted on Twitter. It looks like it was taken. Uh, the, the Russian Central Bank is, is, is offline right now. Uh, but someone did a snapshot. This is as of January. 2022. So the official reserves, as we said, is about $630 billion worth. And again, this is all denominated in US dollars as the goal, as the, the world reserve currency. So how is that break? How is that broken down? Well, you have about uh, $463 billion that's in FX reserves. You have about $132 billion that is in physical gold, which we're going to talk about soon. But how are the FX reserves, this $463 billion piece, how are they held? Well, they're held in the form of securities, as we said, which could be government bonds, mostly uh, the, uh, government bonds like U.S. Treasuries. There may be some stocks as well. And then the other piece is, so that's about $311 billion. The other piece is currency deposits in various places, and that's about $151 billion. So if you do the math, these add up to roughly $630 billion. I'm ignoring the SDRs, which are an IMF basket, uh, currency basket, et cetera. These are fairly small numbers. So we're just going to focus on the FX reserves, which are divided into securities and deposits. 
So what this means is that if they have U.S. Treasuries, they cannot uh, access them if they're held outside of Russia. And even if they are held inside of Russia, what the U.S. is saying is Russia is not allowed to sell these or exchange them for anyone, uh, for, for anything. And basically, they have the QSIP numbers. They know which ones are held by Russia. And what the U.S. can do and the EU can do is basically ban all banks and all brokers and all financial intermedi intermediaries from doing uh, from doing business with Russia and accepting uh, accepting these as well. The currency that's being held abroad in uh, in commercial banks and possibly in central banks as well, they can basically say Russia cannot have this back. So Russia is really in trouble here. They cannot access most. People are saying more than fifty percent of their FX reserve assets. So then we can ask ourselves, what can they access? Which part of these reserves can they still access? Well, it turns out about 13% of their FX reserves, at least as of last summer, it's probably a little bit larger now, is held in Chinese assets. And China has said that they will support Russia and they're not going to freeze any of these uh, Chinese FX reserves that are held uh, killed by Russia. So that's about 13%, roughly $77 billion worth of reserves. In addition, uh, Russia has very large gold reserves. They had more than uh, 2,200, almost 2,300 tons as of the third quarter of 2021. And Russia has been very smart about this. They understand the Bitcoin saying, not your keys, not your coins, which obviously applies to physical gold as well. If you don't hold your physical gold, but you store it somewhere else, then you are taking on counterparty risk because wherever you're storing the gold, they may decide not to give it back to you. It turns out that Russia is holding all of its gold or virtually all of its gold in vaults inside of the Russian Federation. In other words, inside of Russian borders. They're not holding it at the Bank of England in London, which is a very common place to store gold. I think they learned this lesson from Venezuela. Venezuela was storing a bunch of their gold at the Bank of England in London, and the Bank of England just decided not to give them, uh, not to give it back to them. And this is currently uh, in the process of being litigated still, uh, I believe. The other place to hold your gold is at the New York, at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, which is in Manhattan. There are, there's a large uh, gold vault supposedly in the basement floor of the main office in Manhattan. These are the two main places that gold is stored by central banks in London and New York. And it looks like Russia was smart not to be storing their gold in either of those places. They were, they were storing it uh, inside of Russian borders, as we said. So the question this raises and the incentives that it's going to uh, incentivize do you still think that U.S. Treasuries are a safe place to store your savings if they can be turned off by the U.S. government at any time? And the really the big elephant in the room here is what would you do if you were China, for example? So if we look at the tick data, China still holds uh, approximately a trillion dollars worth of U.S. Treasuries. This could act as a deterrent, uh, theoretically, if China were to make a move against Taiwan this trillion dollars could probably be deactivated. On the other hand, China might decide that it's worth uh, the price since they become a very wealthy country and they have their own FX reserves. So what's happened in the past few days is world central banks and all the countries of the world just got a big wake up call. We've seen how the US dollar has become weaponized over the past 20 years, but what happened uh, what happened over the past few days is really unprecedented. None of this is meant to say that the U.S. and its allies did the wrong thing in freeze, freezing Russia here. But what I'm trying to analyze here is the, the global implications going forward of this sort of uh, weaponization of the U.S. dollar. It is now very risky if you're a non-U.S. power or central bank to hold U.S. treasuries and other U.S. De dollar denominated assets because they can be frozen and they can be turned off. So what, is, what does this mean for the U.S. economy? Well, what it means is we have a, a major problem here because we have tax revenue of about $4 trillion a year. We have federal government spending of about $7 trillion. I talk about this a lot in, on my channel, which means we have a budget deficit of about $3 trillion per year. 
And this is uh, this needs to be made up by borrowing money, by issuing government bonds, issuing U.S. treasuries. And the problem now is the whole world has seen, even if you're a European ally of the U.S., you've seen this as well, that U.S. treasuries are not the neutral reserve asset that they used to be, that they're actually very dangerous uh, to hold because of this counterparty risk. You may think you're holding a very strong asset, a risk-free asset, but the thing is, it's a liability of someone else. It's a liability of the U.S. government. They can decide not to pay you off, pay you back, or they can just uh, freeze the asset and prohibit central banks and commercial banks from doing business with you and giving you the liquidity that you need. So what this means is that on the margin, there can be a lot fewer buyers of U.S. debt because they see how weaponized it's become. And what this means is that the Fed is going to once again be the marginal buyer of last resort. They're really the only ones who can sop up the debt on the margins. What this means is the U.S. Central Bank, the Federal Reserve, is not going to be able to shrink its balance sheet in any appreciable manner. It's going to need to keep growing the balance sheet uh, simply because there's going to be a lot less demand for U.S. Treasuries now that this nuclear bomb, uh, this financial nuclear bomb, I should say, has gone off. So what are the takeaways from this video? Number one, if you do global trade, you don't want to store your profits in U.S. dollars or U.S. Treasuries, which can essentially be activated be deactivated. You might be friends with the U.S. at this point, but in the future, you may become a public enemy number one and your treasuries may be, may be frozen. What's the second takeaway? Uh, this is a gigantic blow to the U.S., uh, the global U.S. dollar financial system and the U.S. dollar as a global reserve asset. It no longer makes any sense to hold a reserve asset that can be weaponized and that can be turned off and frozen. And so the biggest takeaway here is that truly neutral money just got a tremendous boost. This is a tremendous boost for physical gold. It's a reminder of why physical gold has been important historically, but it's also a reminder of why Bitcoin is so important. No one should construe this video as a recommendation to buy physical gold. It's very bulky. It's very difficult to trade. It's very expensive to get in and out of. But what I think this suggests is that neutral money just got a big boost. And I think we see uh, really Bitcoin benefiting from this. This is the major, this will be the major beneficiary over the coming coming years and decades because Bitcoin cannot be turned off, cannot be weaponized, and it's much easier to use and move around and verify and assay than is physical gold. I spoke a little bit about this in yesterday's video, which I will link to below. As the global US dollar financial system begins to or continues to fall apart, we really will continue, continue to see this as a major tailwind for Bitcoin. And this is a big wake-up call for all holders of U.S. dollars, all holders of fiat money, everyone who holds reserve assets or assets within the traditional financial system. And on the margins, the money will continue to flow into physical gold, uh, but mostly flow into Bitcoin as 21st century money. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.